What's up, hackers? Welcome to Saturday Hacker Day. My name is Taggart, and today we are going to be taking on some from scratch sock lab creation. But before we do that, we have a little bit of news this week in cyber. So for starters, we have a new entry into the speculative exec execution class of vulnerabilities. This one's being called Ret Bleed, and this affects AMD and Intel CPUs. Now, much like other speculative execution vulnerabilities, we're not entirely sure exactly what the impact is going to be from a security standpoint on this one. If it works, right, if it works reliably, then of course, speculative code execution could be possible on affected CPUs, which is like all of them. And it's entirely possible that that could, of course, lead to secrets disclosure, root level, code execution, blah, 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 blah. But the impact that we know for sure is going to be on performance because the patches for these kinds of vulnerabilities tend to bring with them a performance hit because you're disabling the features that the CPU has inside of it for optimization of your code execution. And so the reports I read are talking a little bit about something on the order of 12 to 15 percent of a performance impact from these patches being applied so the question you're going to have to ask yourself is does this matter to me what kind of performance impact am i willing to absorb to mitigate this threat how real is this threat and i think we have more to learn about this particular kind of vulnerability as with heartbleed and or, sorry not heartbleed as with uh specter we don't necessarily and heartbleed actually yeah uh maybe I'm trying to remember no heartbleed was a, a cgi thing um but definitely with specter you know we had the mitigations but they're not necessarily all employed or deployed i should say because of that performance impact it's a choice that we have to make as asset owners and the maturity of the exploitation of those kinds of vulnerabilities which at the moment eh not so much hurts bleed thanks killer that's the one i was thinking of yeah i knew there was another bleed in there all right moving on this one kind of slipped under the radar at least at least for me and the patch actually for this came out in june but the write-up from the zero day initiative was just released and this one is pretty cool cve 2022-30136 is a vulnerability in microsoft's implementation of nfs the network file system and inside of it is a remote code execution vulnerability that can lead to system level code execution if NFS is enabled on a Windows server. I will link the ZDI write up for this one because in all honesty, some of it's a little bit over my head because I didn't do the reverse engineering of the NFS protocol to take a look at it. But the TLDR on this one is that if this thing isn't patched and a server is providing NFS, then a specially crafted network packet can be sent to the thing to trigger remote code execution. And just to underscore the severity of this, if NFS is enabled, the CVE was awarded a whopping 9.8 on the CVSS scale. So this is a cool one to add to the tool belt if we have a good proof of concept for it. And also, if you haven't added these patches, system administrators, definitely get on that. This is one you're going to want to patch, especially if you're using the NFS subsystem on your servers. Not everybody is, but it's something to think about. Staying on Windows for just a moment, I have good news, or rather Microsoft does. As of the 11th, Microsoft has made Windows Auto Patch, which is an enterprise service. It doesn't come free. It doesn't come cheap either, but it is pretty rad. So Auto Patch is now generally available for E3 and E5 customers. Now, it might sound like I'm shilling for Microsoft. I promise that's not the case. I certainly don't get any kickbacks from them. In fact, I can't. But I am excited about this feature, and let me tell you why. For a while, configuration management and endpoint management in Microsoft World has been split between two different solutions. One of them is called... SCCM or Config Manager, and that's an on-prem solution that allows you to spin up servers that deploy policies and packages to endpoints that you're managing. It is very desktop oriented. It is very old school in its modality. 
the newer version of that is a mobile device management solution called Intune, which is a cloud-based solution. Intune allows you to manage more than just your Windows endpoints. It has a lot more features and, and a little bit more of a modern way of interacting with your endpoints for post-provisioning. However, the two in the previous uh, previously didn't really work together, but they were brought together in a product called Microsoft, I want to say Endpoint Manager. I think that's right. Yes, Microsoft Endpoint Manager, which is a cloud based solution that brings together your SCCM and your Intune configurations into one single dashboard and pane of glass, if if you will for, forgive the cliche. So what does auto patch do inside of that endpoint manager tool auto patch will allow you to set up groups that you can deploy new updates automatically to rather than pushing out updates yourself. And it will even handle doing uh, deployment rings. So you can have a first batch of assets that you deploy to first, and then a second, and then a third, and then a fourth. And then if there's a problem with any of the deployments, you can then trigger a rollback. So that's pretty exciting. Now, this does only apply to endpoints, which is another way of saying workstations or desktops, right? So this doesn't apply to servers. For servers, you're still going to have to use a pretty standard change management process. But that being said, I'm excited about this technology because, and there are other there are other uh, third party tools that have provided this functionality for some time. I think um, like Zero Patches is another one. But I'm excited that this is coming from Microsoft because one of the problems we know is that updates are not applied in a timely fashion in a lot of places. And so if you can make it easier for administrators to apply those patches, the odds are that the average security posture of an organization is going to increase. And that's always a good thing. But as I said, it doesn't come cheap. It's an E3 and E5 offering right now. I suspect it will probably become available later for their small business offerings and other licensing levels as well. All right. With that out of the way, we're going to get into our main material today, and that is Elastic Stack. So we've been using the Elastic Stack, Elastic Search, Logstash, Kibana in the SOC lab for some time, but we kind of cheated. We did it by deploying from a kind of one move script from our pals at Waza, who gave us a single command we could run and it would install Elastic Search and Logstash and set everything up to work with Waza. I've kind of been chilling on using Waza recently because I want to explore another data collection mechanism, in particular the first party one from Elastic, which is the Elastic Agent. The reason I'm interested in doing that is because I've had some problems with Waza in how it parses some data, in, in particular things like uh, Zeek data for packet captures, and even the way that you have to handle alert management in Waza is... I appreciate that it's open source, but it still feels kind of clunky that I have to manually edit XML files in order to change up alerting to get all of the telemetry that I want inside of my scene. So we're going to give Elastic Agent a shot and we're going to do it with the intent of building the Elastic Stack from scratch so we understand every single part of the stack, understand what's going on, and then later we can learn how to automate it in a reasonable way. That's what's up. So let's get started. Goodbye, news window. All right. And music comes back. All right. You might notice that my posture is a little bit different. I am standing up. I'm, this is the first time using the standing desk on a uh, stream. Um, so we'll see how that goes. The camera might be a little bit shaky as I type. So if it is, I apologize. But uh, uh, it feels good not to be sitting down for three hours. So that's a trade-off I'll take for the moment. All right, we're here in the SOC lab, and we are going to start by uh, spinning up a single workstation with our Terraform solution. By the way, as of like 10 minutes ago, I have finally published the SEC lab repository. Now, it's not done, okay? Just as an FYI, it is not done. 
But if you're interested in testing this out in your own Proxmox environment, you're more than welcome to give it a try. So the way that it's structured is exactly what you see here. I'll zoom this in so it's a little bit easier to see. We have Ansible folders with different roles and playbooks. We have Packer and we have uh, Terraform. Now, keep in mind that a lot of the defaults here right now are kind of designed for the network architecture that I'm going after. Particularly, keep in mind that your inventory may look a little bit different than mine. And yes, there are default passwords in here for the lab to be used. If you want to change those up, you're more than welcome to do so, but make sure that you change them in the appropriate places. So it's not that different from the way that Vagrant works. It's just that we're using our own defaults rather than Vagrant's because I wanted more control over that configuration. Uh, we have Packer templates for PFSense. I have yet to do the one for OpenSense, which is actually our router right now because it's a new thing and I have to figure out how to automate that. Ubuntu 20.04 as well as 22.04. We have a Packer template for Windows Server 2019 and Windows 10. And so if you're interested in spinning those up, you can do that. And also all of the configuration for this is set up with uh, environment variables, right? So you will want to take a look at the Proxmox and Terraform if you want to use the Terraform side of things documentation to learn the environment variables that you have to set to use your API token or your username and password to get this stuff spun up with Proxmox credentials. So I have that already configured here in my environment, but you're going to want to do that in yours if you're interested in using this, this lab. Okay, with that in mind, let's spin up a single workstation like a Windows workstation to just kind of prove that our Terraform stuff is working and bring up a target for us to work with uh, in our uh, in our SOC lab. So uh, basically something to install the Elastic Agent on. So we're going to go into the single workstation. Oops, wrong way. Try to zoom that in a little bit more for everybody. So go into single workstation. And we only have a main.tf. Let's take a look at what that's doing for us. So main.tf, this is a Terraform file. If you're not familiar with Terraform, it's a really great tool that allows you to spin up cloud assets. This is technically a tiny little local cloud and do so based on the configuration that you give it. So what's nice about this is that I'm basing this off of a template that I'm going to be cloning, meaning I don't have to reconfigure the entire thing. I'm basing it off of a pre-installed operating system image that has all the configurations that I already need, including the SSH configuration that I want to use for Ansible, as well as the network interfaces that I want configured and pretty everything else that I want for defaults here. So it's a lot easier for me to just use this as my starting point. Everything else looks good here. And then at the end, you'll see that I'm outputting two things. I'm outputting the ID as well as the IP address. So in our environment, it will be reporting home. Uh, we, we give it two different network interfaces, one of which is connected to the internet, one of which is not. But this second one, which is not connected to the internet, is actually the network that we're going to use for the SOC lab environment. So the VMIP is going to report home on these things, and that is the basic deal. Let's go ahead and run Terraform init Terraform. I should probably just alias uh, Terraform to TF. It's actually a good idea. Um, alias TF equals Terraform. TF init. And so that initializes the back end and it goes and gets any of the providers that I need, like Proxmox. It configures Terraform to work the way that I want. I'm then going to run TF plan to guarantee. That's still a little bit small, isn't it? That's better. I'll do TF plan to confirm that everything is working the way that I expect. I got all green boxes. Everything looks good. It didn't error out on trying to authenticate to Proxmox, which it would have if I didn't have my correct environment variables. And then we'll do TF apply and we'll do auto approve. Up it goes. Let's go check on Starbase to see how it's doing. A new workstation has been created, as you can see. It has all of the configurations that we expected. 
Let's take a look at the console for it. It's not up right now because it's still getting created, but should be up in just a minute. How was everybody's week? Hopefully not too crazy. A happy Bastille Day to mes amis français. That that's not today. It was on the fourteenth, but it was the last time. It's since the last time I saw y'all. All right, so the machine's coming up. And the reason why it is able to phone home with its IP address is because we installed the QEMU agent on this thing. Which was part of the Packer build. So if you think about the, the process here, just to reiterate for anyone who's new to what we're doing, we build the template with Packer, we deploy it with Terraform, and then we post-provision it for any roles or packages or whatever else we want to deploy to our host sets with Ansible. That's the plan. Okay, so you can see that the machine is up and it phoned home with an IP address. Now, 192.168.99.11 is the default IP address, but I actually want the rest of the information. So... I mean, it actually doesn't matter for us right now, but we do have this up and running. But just to prove that everything is working as intended, let's go ahead and... Uh, I have... Yeah, let's SSH into it. Seclab at 192.168.99.111. Yes, I'll trust it. And I'll put in... The Windows Seclab password, and I have a Windows shell over SSH. So everything there is working as intended. We have successfully used Terraform to bring up a workstation. And that's all we need right now. Okay. Now, if we go back over into Terraform, the Terraform folder, you'll see that we also have a SOC server folder. So what I want to do with the SOC server folder is build out the SOC server. That's it. It's not that complicated. So we're going to go over to that in Terraform. And you can see that I've done it before, but we're going to uh, bring it back up because I wanted to do it live because that's always effective, right? Now, the SOC server is a little bit more complicated than the single workstation. For one thing, let's full screen this just so it's easier to read. For one thing, this thing is based on a different template. Of course, it is an Ubuntu machine, and I'm basing it on 2004 just because it's easier. Um, it's a known quantity, right? Not everything has updated perfectly to work with 2204 just yet. And in addition to the regular two network interfaces that we know all the lab machines have, I'm giving it a third because this one's going to be for the packet capture when I'm ready to spin that up. It's on the same virtual switch as the isolation lab. That's where we're doing the packet capture, but it is explicitly disabling the hypervisor's firewall. This is in fact a default, but I'm putting it here explicitly to indicate that this is the PCAP network interface. We also have some extra work that we need to do if we want to set a static IP for this thing. And of course, I definitely want to set a static IP for this thing. Why is that? Well, this thing is going to be more or less permanent. Yes, I'm using Terraform to spin it up, but it's going to be permanent in my lab as part of the infrastructure. It's the SOC server after all, right? It's going to stick around for a while. So I want it to have a static IP, and that's the thing that the agents are going to phone home to. In order to set up that static IP, what do I need to do? Well. I am using the Ubuntu blessed way of setting up the IP configuration. Proxmox and in fact, this provider for Terraform will tell you that there's another way to do it. It'll tell you that you can configure your network interface 
and it'll kind of brute force it with the old school Etsy network interfaces file and IF up, IF down. Yes, you can do it that way, but you shouldn't. You really should be using NetPlan to make this happen. And so in order to use NetPlan to make this happen, especially on a server that isn't using Network Manager, right, which is the case, in order to make this happen, we have to change up the file that NetPlan is looking at to do its work. So first thing I do is I'm just doing some housekeeping here of changing the host name to what I want it to be. That's just creature comfort. That doesn't really have any functional difference for me especially because I'm putting Seclab sock into my Jumpbox's Etsy host file, and that's really how I'm doing my uh, host resolution, just because it's easier than maintaining a DNS server. The next part, though, super important. Notice that I am, before I do anything from shell commands, I'm using a file provisioner. And what this does is it uses the SSH connection to upload a local file, this guy right here, and load it into the given destination. Now, keep in mind that this thing does not, Terraform does not have root. It has sudo privileges, and we've configured the uh, seclab on the endpoint to run sudo with no password, but it doesn't have root privileges. So the file destination, I have to drop it to temp first. Then I can use MB commands in the remote exec provisioner to move it into place. So you can see I'm moving the old installer config.yaml to a backup file, leaving it there in case I need it for any reason. Then I'm moving the temp netplan yaml over to etsy netplan 00 netplan.yaml. And the way that, like in many Linux things, the way this works is that the netplan service is going to process these files sequentially based on their file name so just guaranteeing that this is the first one that it handles once that's done we change the host name live as we've done with the hosts and hostname files and then we run this is kind of a nice one-two punch and you have to do it this way so sudo netplan apply will change the IP address of the machine. And the problem with that is that it's going to break the SSH connection that, <laughs> that Terraform has to the host. So to prevent that from killing your build, you at the same time have to add back the IP address that it previously had from DHCP. And so that's why we're doing this and and sudo IP add or add and then the dev ENS18. This is just the first network interface. That's this guy right here. And we're setting it to self.default IPv4 address, which it knows by which Terraform knows by now and can use as a variable. So it's a little bit funky, but when we build this up, basically the SOC server is going to have two infrastructure IP addresses. But when we reboot the machine, it will lose that extra IP address and no harm, no foul. But it's just a way of maintaining that connection for Terraform while we're setting the static IP address. And then we're just running IPAS to confirm that that has configured correctly. And then we're using the VM IP as our output. Let's do it. So we're going to do Terraform or TF. Wow, cannot type at all. TF apply, auto approve. And up it comes. Camera's a little high. Let's fix that. There we go. All the angles and everything are different with the standing desk. Oh, that's funny. Did I forget to change a host name somewhere? I did. I forgot to change it in the sock server. This should be Seclab sock. Let's kill it and rebuild it with that. That doesn't really matter. We could have changed that after the fact, but. Now, while we're bringing this thing up, what I'm basically going to be doing is I'm going to be following the steps laid out in the elastic documentation and they mirror kind of the the documentation from this cool book threat hunting with elastic stack 
that I was reading. And I think the reason for the difference is basically just dates. This thing was published in July 2021, so it's a year old at this point, and I think Elastic has changed up some of the way that it works. Not like a lot, but enough that there are differences. Now, when you go to installing Elasticsearch as a document, the documentation, Elastic's docs are actually kind of awesome. And they give you a bunch of different options, whether you want to install from the tar or if you want to install from the deb. My personal preference is to install from the deb because that's a little bit easier to automate. But weirdly, when you do that with Kibana, they tell you like not to do that. They don't want you to install from the Debian package. And that largely has to do with updating and things like that. But I don't know. I think we're going to try it anyway, just because it is easier. It does put things in different locations from other documentation, but it's discoverable. So we're going to try the, the Deb first and, and see how that goes. And in terms of automation, where we would go for that is Ansible. Right. And so we can build out a role that defines apt repositories that we add for Elastic and then installing packages and setting up systemd services and all of that good stuff. That's kind of why I like doing it with the Debian package, because you can get that kind of automation going pretty quickly. The one problem with doing it with Ansible, though, as we'll see, is that there is output on the command line. <laughs> that you definitely need to see. And it's like tricky to get it after the fact, at least as far as I know so far, I, I may learn something about how to do that. Okay, let's build this again. There we go. I was like, I know we just killed SecLab Docker. Let's try that again. So what's nice about this approach, right, is that you can have this Git repository. I recommend setting it up on a jump box, and that jump box is like the first VM that you set up in your lab, right? And you can do that manually if you want. There are scripts that we can talk about to make that easier, but basically it's whatever your preferred working environment is. I'm using KDE Neon, but at the end of the day, what are you going to need on that jump box? Basically, you're going to need Terraform, Ansible, and Packer. That's it. And then VS Code or some other text editor to edit your files. Once you have all of those, the jump box then can communicate with your networks as needed. You'll also want to make sure that your jump box has network interfaces on any networks that you design for your lab. So in my case, I have the infrastructure network, right? And I have the lab network. And those, actually I have three because I also have a presence on my LAN for easy remote desktop, which is what I'm doing here. All right, so this thing is booting up. Once it's up, Terraform will handle the hostname management. and the net plan stuff. Now you can see that I've already added 192.168.99.2 to my sock or to my Etsy hosts file. And so I can just SSH into that once it's done. All right, so it's connected, it's still creating. Oh, nerds, I think I messed this up. 
uh, just a little bit by not manually setting the metric for this route. That is fixable, though. So if we SSH seclab at seclab sock, see, I actually can connect to it. If we look at the IP addresses that this thing has, yep, 99.2, but it doesn't have the other IP address. So we're going to do sudo IP adder add dev. Oops. Nothing like doing it live. I mean, that's true. Honestly, this is not a particularly... Uh, particularly showstopper of a bug. Netplan is a gigantic pain in the ass, though. I will say that. Yeah, so this might have down actually well no it actually it brought it up and it didn't bring it down so that's okay so terraform did its job even if it wasn't able to like report home that it did so that's actually fine um so the machine is up so all's well there let's exit out of this i don't need to be connected to the starbase right now all right so we have ourselves a connection to the sec lab sock which means we're ready to start installing elastic from scratch. And as I said, we're going to do this the deb based way. So I'm going to bring this window over here. All right. So we'll have this kind of side by side here documentation and the SSH session. And by the way, VizTech and Big Blue Swope, thank you so much for those follows. First things first, we're going to have to add the Elasticsearch PGP key, which is this fun wget command here. And again, so far, everything that we're doing is something that we can automate with Ansible. Okay. App Transport HTTPS is already installed, so we don't need to worry about that one. Now we're going to add this to a new source list. So notice what we're doing. Echo, deb, signed by, user share, key rings, elastic search, key ring, GPG, which is what we created up here. We're going to add that to Etsy app sources.list.d slash elastic 8.x.list. So this is basically adding a place for apt to look for updates. All right, looks good. Once that is done, we can do sudo apt update and sudo apt install y elastic search. And this is the part that creates output on the terminal that I would have to capture somehow with Ansible, I believe. for my initial setup. So this is going to go ahead and solve. Let me look that up, actually. How do we reset the Elastic user password? What if we can set it to something? No, I don't want to do it from there. I want to do it from the command line. Ah, excellent. Elastic reset password command resets the password of users in the native realm and built-in users. Use this command to reset the password of any user in the native realm or any built-in user. Uh, oh, cool. Okay, so we actually can do this, assuming we can collect the output.
we're going to go through this manually and then start thinking about how to build out the 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 role. I'll start the Ansible folder for this in roles. And yes, I did look. We'll call it elk stack. And new folder, tasks, and new file, main.yaml. Okay. So we know that we need to do add the elastic uh, GPG key. That's kind of step one. And then we'll do name add elastic repo name install elastic search i'm not filling in everything else right now but that's kind of like the beginning of our ansible playbook right just creating the names of the tasks all right there it is you can see that the initial password has been set for the elastic built-in super user and we need that thing. It also tells us that it is not yet started, right? So, so sudo system ctl daemon reload is necessary, but we're actually not ready to do that just yet. And this is something I, I know for a fact, because I know I want to hit this thing from a remote server. That is not how Elasticsearch is configured by default. It's configured for local host access only. So to fix that, the first thing I need to do is sudo vim etsy elasticsearch elasticsearch.yaml. I promise it's there. Yeah, there it is. And so we're going to go look for server host. Or host. Oh, it said HTTP host. Oh, that is set correctly. Wonderful. If that's true, then we can simply do sudo systemctl daemon reload to add that config. sudo systemctl enable Elasticsearch. And then start. Now we're going to copy this password right here for right now. Because we're going to need it to test to confirm that this thing is actually working. Might take a second. Now, what role does Elastic Search play in the Elk stack? This is where the data lives. It essentially is the database layer that allows us to query for data that is added to different indices that we add that we add data to, right? And so that data is picked up um, by something called Logstash or other tools, right? We could use Waza for it, but you know, Logstash is the L in Elk. And then Kibana is the front end. Kibana is the web interface that allows us to interact with this data in a usable way. So that's kind of the three parts of the Elk stack. And so we, we have already Elasticsearch and Logstash. Those are kind of already available for us. And then Kibana would be the next thing that we install. Hey, listener, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate that. It's been a labor of love building out this lab environment, but uh, you are more than welcome to take a look at the source code for the templates and things like that and modify them for your own use. All right, so Elastic is running, and just to confirm that it's running, I'm going to curl, hey, HTTPS, 
localhost 9200. And it tells me that, hey, you can't do that because you don't have any authentication. Well, that's why we copied that password. We're going to give curl a user of elastic and that password. And that I'll also do it with question mark pretty. So elastic is up and running. Tagline, you know, for search. All right, fair enough. So that part is easy peasy. Now, I want to see if we can actually make that password reset work. So we're going to do uh, sudo uh, user share elastic search bin that is where if you install this thing from the debian package right that is where the elasticsearch stuff is going to live rather than in the extracted folder that you would get if you downloaded the tarball that difference is subtle but it does matter when you're looking for specific tools like elasticsearch reset password If we do dash u elastic please confirm that you would like to continue i'm actually going to control c this there's like no and pass the dash s for silence so that it doesn't ask me to do yes or no. Mm. That didn't work. You stop to force execution of the command against the cluster that's currently happening. Nope, don't want that. So we have to do it. Um, unfortunate. Okay. But again, we got to see if we can make that happen automatically or Oh, there is a way to do that. No, that's not that's not really what we want here. So if we do the Ansible built-in shell module, right? What can we do? Tactical, thank you for the follow. Creates freeform, removes standard in. Set the standard of the command directly to the specified value. All right, let's, I mean, I don't think this is going to work, but we're going to try it anyway. Ha! 
hell yes! I did not expect that to work. Usually, uh, these tools will not allow you to send uh, standard input like that. But that is great news. That means uh, that we can, in fact, automate the reset of this thing. And all we have to do is capture the output to get the new Ansible password. Uh, that is really cool. So once install Elasticsearch, what else do we need to do? We do name, um, enable, uh, reload, send D daemon. And then we're going to do name, uh, enable system D service. Search system D service. And then we'll do start <laughs> system D service. Yeah. Okay. And then. Reset elastic user password. And this one I can fill in a little bit because I'm thinking about it right now. Ansible dot uh, built in dot shell. Uh, and then the command is going to be uh, user share, I think, right? Yep. User share elastic search bin elastic search reset password you elastic. Very good. And then standard in is going to just be Y. <laughs> Literally just the string Y. And then well, the command itself is arbitrary canopy search check mode. It has crazy rooms. So I'm hoping this is good. And then... We're gonna warn no on this, basically. And that should handle the creation of the or resetting the elastic user password, and we should get that output, I hope. Um, Oh, you know what? Okay, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, register uh, EP. Nope. And then what 
what we're going to do after that is name print new password. Homsa. And this will be ansible.builtin.debug. And the message is going to be ps. Dot, or ep, not ps, ep.std out. I believe. I could be way off base, but I'm pretty sure that's going to help us out here um, once we're ready to do that. But I want to focus more on actually getting Ansible up than the automation of it, which will be added to the SecLab repository once it's done. Okay, so we have Elasticsearch working. And now we have to install Kibana. Installing Kibana is a much easier situation as a second step <laughs> um, here because we've already installed the Elasticsearch source, right? So all we have to do now is sudo apt install <laughs> why Kibana. That's it, right? And that will install Kibana for us. Now, once it's installed, we're going to have to create an enrollment token from Elasticsearch. But luckily, we have the Elasticsearch create enrollment token for the Kibana service, like ready to go here. Oh, today is the Diana Initiative CTF. That is cool. I don't really have time for CTFs anymore. I've essentially dropped myself into my own CTFs in the lab and other research that I'm doing. I used to really love doing CTFs, though. All right, so you can see that Kibana has been installed. Now what we're going to do is we're going to sudo uh, user user share Elasticsearch bin Elasticsearch create enrollment token s Kibana Cult of Corgos HTTP also has a big one ECTF going on. Oh, do they really? That's interesting. All right. See this right here? That's our enrollment token, and that matters because we are going to be going to... Oh, we have to enable systemd. Let's actually confirm that Kibana has everything that we need set up. So let's sudo vim etsy kibana. Well, it's ls etsy kibana. Okay, sudo vim etsy kibana, kibana.yaml. I want to make sure that this thing is configured to run. Yeah, server.host. That ain't right. We're going to change server.host from localhost. This is the one that I we need to change to quad zeros for now. Or we could send it to uh, like 192.168.99.2 if we wanted to. Which might actually be a smarter move. Okay. With that done, sudo systemctl 
Demon Reload. Sudo System CTL. Enable Kibana. And start Kibana. Enable, come on. Start Kibana.service. Okay. And then let's just confirm that that thing is up and running. Oh, yeah. All right. Having done so, we should be able to go to SecLab SOC port 5601. Uh, I think it's actually HTTP, not HTTPS. Or, you know, not. If we try to do 192.168.99.2. Connection refused. Oh, there it is. It just took a second for it to come up. <laughs> uh, I want to make sure I can do it with the host name, though. Oh, yeah. In this case, it was just impatience. Okay, let's get that enrollment token. Configure Elastic. Now we have to run the Kibana verification code. This is kind of cool. So we're going to do uh, sudo user share Kibana now rather than Elasticsearch bin Kibana verification code. And that gives us the code that we have to enter here. So that's going to be 995495. What is happening? What? <laughs> Did I accidentally try to paste something in? It looks like it's trying to fill out a bunch of fields. Let me close this. Okay. 995. 495. That was different. Saving settings, starting elastic, completing setup. So, you know, I have been like really resistant to doing a manual setup of elk for a long time it ain't about much honestly it's not that tough uh let's log in with the elastic user well, let me go grab that reset password that we got here i think it's that one right there so we're gonna log in with the elastic and pop that right in oh no <laughs> Um, let's restart Elastic because we had that user uh, that username change or that that password reset, right? Ah, uh, I get to ban somebody. All right, let's try that again. It still doesn't like that. Okay. Um, let's reset that password. <laughs> Maybe I got the wrong password. Okay. Okay, I just got the wrong password. Lovely, and you don't have to reset the service. That's great news. Okay. Just brute force the password. Okay, I'm gonna 
it wants us to go right to add integrations and we do want to do that quickly but not just yet i want to explore on my own and the first thing i need to do oh my god is turn on dark mode um to do that we're going to go to stack management advanced settings Dark mode. I know, Corgos. I know. Luckily, they do make it easy to enable that. Ooh. I actually wonder, is that a setting in... Um... Okay. Uh, oh, it should be, actually. Um, this is something you could set from the, uh, from the config file, right? Uh, the theme, set the theme to dark mode if I wanted to. Hey, Wally. And I think theme isn't in here, but I'm pretty sure that we could set that from the command line, which, meh. Anyway, now that we can actually deal with this thing, we have, so we have the whole set, the whole system like up and ready to go, right? That's pretty cool. Now we haven't created any indices or anything, and that's kind of because I want to do this the right way, right? So I'm, I'm kind of go through Elastic's kind of blessed path to make this happen. So the first thing I want to do is I want to set up, it says add integrations, right? So I'm going to click on add integrations and it has all of these different integrations that are ready to go for it. And that's kind of cool. But as you'll find out, a lot of them under the hood are going to rely on the elastic agent being set up in the first place. So uh, in fact, if I search for, like, Sysmon, I'm pretty sure. No? Is it, like, Windows Event Logs? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, that. So, I can do that. That's no problem. But, again, I need the Elastic Agent set up first. And, for whatever reason, whenever I search for Agent, it, like... It has too many things because everything is using, look, Elastic Agent, Elastic Agent, Elastic Agent, blah, 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 blah. Oh, my God. So the easiest way to do this is just click on Elastic Stack. And look, that's what you want. <laughs> this is the first thing that you want to set up. And from here, it's point and click. We're going to add Elastic Agent, which is also going to set up Fleet. Choose name and description to help identify how this integration will be used. Integration name, Elastic Agent, that's fine. We'll call it Elastic Agent. Advanced Options. Namespace is default. That's fine. Everybody's getting the Elastic Agent. Agent Policy 1. We'll call it Default Policy. Yes, very good. Default Namespace. That's all fine. That's all fine. That's all fine. That's all fine. Save and continue. So is this similar to a C2, but without the command and control? Kind of. Yeah, it's, um, it is, think of it as open source endpoint detection and response and response for real. The Elastic Agent actually does have a response component where if it, uh, you can set up so that if it alerts on something, you can have it kill processes that, um, that are flagged. So it actually is like open source EDR. It's pretty cool. All right, we're going to add Elastic Agent to your hosts. That's the next thing it wants us to do in order to do that. I love the way that it walks through this thing. Oh, Wally, I'm so sorry. I missed the your hello. Um, I'm doing well. Thank you so much for asking. How are you? But yeah, I'm going to add the fleet server. And it's going to walk us through making this happen. For more information, see the fleet and Elastic Agent guide. I will. We 
we're going to do self-managed. But we have to install the fleet server in the first place. Found a Python module of Elasticsearch. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, now we're just in the same place twice. Self-managed. I think that this this walkthrough will actually do it for us. Um or not. Let's let's actually go let's exit out of this. Um, and go to fleet here first. Okay, so here we say get started with fleet server. So we're going to do this. It was actually the same UI, right? It was the same view. We're just looking at it here instead of it was part of the Elastic Agent. So we're going to change up the fleet server host. It's going to be um, uh, 10.1.99.2. That is because... That is the IP address we gave the server, the SOC server, on the isolation lab. And so that is the subnet that I want to, to use inside lab for everything to communicate. So 10.1.99.2 port 1299. I swear. Some funny stuff happens. When I click on the terminal and sh like, yeah, it's 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 about um, RDP really. Hold on, let me just disconnect from this and reconnect with it. Yeah, it's about the RDP connection. At least I thought it was. Okay. Now it's going to generate this policy. I don't think that was that was like a, maybe a brave browser thing or something. I'm not sure what was up there, but reloading the page got it working. Okay, so the fleet server policy is created. Now, this part, it says we recommend using the installers over system packages because they provide the ability to upgrade your agent with fleet. I guess that's fine, but I kind of want... Install fleet server to a centralized host. So fleet server agent on a centralized host so that other hosts you wish to monitor can connect to it. All right, I will. I will follow their. Is so they're getting they're using the elastic agent here, right? And then they're setting up the fleet server. So this is already set up. Um. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do the curl. I'm going to do this line by line for a reason. Um, because the way this thing copy pastas, it doesn't really work with the new lines here. So if I do the curl command first, I'll go get the agent. Then I'll tar and then CD into the agent. Okay. And then we'll CD into the Elastic Agent folder and run all of this. The Elastic Agent will be installed at Opt Elastic Agent and will run as a service. Do you want to continue? Yes, I do. Hey, look, <laughs> it looks like the same kind of data you would get from uh, from Logbeats. Elastic Agent has been successfully installed. Wunderbar. So here we're just waiting to confirm the connection. Fleet server connected. Now you can just add agents. That was pretty freaking easy, right? Like, that wasn't so bad at all. So we're going to enroll this thing in a fleet. And let's go to the default policy. We're going to enroll a new agent. And it's Windows. In order to make this happen... Um... I can either SSH directly into my Windows workstation. Or I could do it over RDP. But since I have SSH... Hey, Hate Handles, thank you so much for the raid, friend. Really appreciate that. How was your stream? All right, so we're just going to run this PowerShell script here. Good, got stuck on what I swear is a DC sync attack. Boy. You and me both, buddy. Yeah, let's clear all of that. Let's try that. All right. So we're downloading the Elastic Agent. And we're installing it on our remote Windows workstation. And then we get to play with it. And see the kind of data we can collect from it. Oh, you were doing forest. Okay. Yeah. No defense necessary. AD stuff is crazy, man. Ugh. I actually had, um, if we had done Tuesday stream, I, I was... Uh, I was flummoxed by some technical stuff. I had to basically rebuild the server uh, from scratch <laughs> this week because I did something really dumb. But uh, we were going to do Active Directory, um, uh, Active Directory hacking um, basics because it's like, I mean, the thing with the thing with box uh, like try hack me and hack the box difficulty ratings is that it's like, oh, it's easy if you know this one specific piece of esoterica and if you don't know it then eh, maybe you can figure out what to research to find it out or not and that is kind of one of the problems with the whole that like that entire learning regime 
is that often you will get to uncrossable chasms. Okay, we're going to install the Elastic Agent. So, Killer, <laughs> to be fair, like... Ooh, enroll failed. Failed to execute. Ooh, certificate signed by unknown authority. That sucks. Can we... Uh... Can we ignore the HTTPS? Yeah, let's see. Elastic Agent install. And then insecure. Please. Yes. Delicious. Mwah. That's what you want to see. Elastic Agent has been successfully installed. And... Oh my god, this is so much easier. That's really cool. I didn't think it was going to be... I, I didn't think it was going to be that simple. Look at that. Okay, so... Um, now let's take advantage of the extra data. So we've got the, we've got the lab, uh, installed, right? Now we can install Sysmon on it. Uh, what was this thing? 192.168.99.111. So in, if I, if I go to my inventory in Ansible, do, 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 right here. Right? We'll use demo for this rather than Windows hosts. Okay. Um, and I have a Sysmon playbook. And, okay, so actually, I will use Windows hosts for this. Windows hosts. Uh, this will install Sysmon. And the reason I want to do that, the SecLab Ansible, is we're going to do Ansible Playbook. I inventory.yaml. That allows me to set up a local inventory file so I don't have to worry about like the global one. Um, and then I'm going to give it the uh, sysmon.yaml. And because there's only one thing in Windows hosts, that's all it's going to work from, and that should be fine. Um, oh, so you have to install SSH pass. I knew it was going to do that, and... I forgot to reinstall it. As I said, this this jump box has existed for like five days because I had to rebuild the whole thing. There we go. So it has successfully connected over SSH to the Windows host, which is still a funny sentence to me. And it is now gathering everything it needs. And then it's going to go ahead and install Sysmon following our Sysmon playbook, which goes like this. It downloads Sysmon. This might fail. I'm not sure. No, it's an admin. This should be fine. Um, and then it's going to use Swiss, Swift on Securities config for Sysmon. It's going to install the thing. And then it's going to remove the extra files. 
Easy peasy. This is why I love using Ansible to do stuff like this. Ah. So, we did have a problem with that, and that's actually something I should update anyway. Um, we're going to change that to SecLab. Yeah, let's try that again. Meanwhile, let's go back over to our... Agents over here. Pretty cool. So if we click on any one of these, it gives us our integrations, right? We've got system monitoring, got logs. It's pretty cool. But now if we go back home, right, we can add more integrations. And in particular, stuff that we can do is we can look for like Windows event logs. Collect, uh, let's do collect logs and metrics from Windows OS and services with Elastic Agent. So this is going to do security application system logs. I've been moved Move to the system package. All right, let's add this. And we're going to add this to existing hosts by choosing our default policy. Save and continue. And it's going to update. It tells you that it's going to update an agent. Yes, indeed. That's what we want. Go get it. And that will phone home to, or actually phone out to the agent to update its policy to start collecting things. You can see the Sysmon has been installed. So now I can do custom. Let's do the Windows custom Windows events. Okay, custom Windows event log package. Uh, Scalia Rungs Biologe, thank you so much for the follow. I'm sure I completely trashed that uh, that name, that pronunciation. Shields up, also thank you for the follow. Now I want to actually confirm that this is whoa. Uh, I want to confirm this is actually where I want to go with this. And to do that, I'm going to go look up Threat Hunting with Elastic Stack. This is the book that I was reading that got me interested in doing things this way. Uh, and I want to do configuring uh, Sysmon for Endpoint Connection. So this is like setting up Sysmon the same way that we did, basically. And then it's using Packet Beat, but I actually don't want Packet Beat. Like the whole point is that we're using the agent to do this. So maybe we just straight up do a goog for Sysmon Elastic Agent. If that book isn't going to give me the same... Let's see what's up. What do you got for me, Unicorn Sec? Yeah, 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 yeah. Testing data. Where is that book available? That book, Threat Hunting with Elastic Stack, is available from Packet Publishing. Um, by Andrew Pease. And so... It has some really good information in there. It's a it's a good starting point. Um, so if you have a packet subscription, you'll be able to get it. Um, and it's uh, forty one ninety nine. I got it as part of a humble bundle, but it's forty one ninety nine uh, for the ebook and fifty one ninety nine for print. 
I've been very I've been very happy with the stuff that I've gotten from Packet. It's it's pretty solid quality. Okay. Well, let's see what we're getting right now. Oh, I I have I have so many humble bundle purchases. What do I enjoy more printer ebooks? Um so I tend to for this stuff, I tend to enjoy ebooks more. Enjoy is not really the right word. I just like I utilize it better because I have I do a lot of my reading on an iPad, and that's like all I do with the iPad, except I guess now test iOS apps, but um the iPad is basically my e-reader, and so anything I can throw on there, I can take notes. That's the big thing for me with the e-reader is I can highlight stuff, take notes, um, and refer to that later. That's a big deal for me. And so, yeah. And then I can travel with as many books as I want on the iPad. I've been an e-reader user for a long time. I actually, I love e-ink displays, and I'm bummed that, like, there isn't a really good, like, the Kobo isn't good enough for me as an open source reader, and I'm not paying however much money for a freaking remarkable tablet. As good as they look, I'm not paying that much money. I don't like handwriting that much. In fact, I... Here's a little bit of uh, Taggart lore. I was taught to type on a keyboard before I learned how to write with a pen or pencil when I was a kid. Because my dad was convinced that in the future uh, we wouldn't do any handwriting. And so far that's been true. Like, I basically only handwrite when I have to endorse checks. Um, but other than that, it's been all keyboard. So my handwriting is... Like, my printing is fairly, fairly rough. My cursive is actually pretty good um, for other reasons. <laughs> Visionary ahead of his time. Uh, he was also a right proper jackass, but he was right about that. Um, when you feel you've drifted. Writing will become obsolete. So, listener, as an educator, I have to tell you that that's only kind of true. Um, there will never be... I don't think a future where the mech the mechanics of shaping letters with your hands without typing on the keys um, won't exist in some way, shape, or form. Even if it's like through programmable matter or like holographic interfaces or whatever. But I don't ever see a future where children are not producing art of one form or another. They're writing letters on pieces of medium uh, of some kind and that it's getting displayed on walls. That's just like a core part of the human experience. And I do not see that going away. And in fact, we don't want it to. Honestly, if you think about the kind of stuff that is permanent and the stuff that people care about long term, it is really still so physical, right? If you think about the stuff that gets stored by your mom in a trunk, um, it's not flash drives. <laughs> it's, it's you know, pieces of paper. Um, it's, it's material. And, um, you know, I think a lot about material, like, uh, material culture because uh, my wife is an archaeologist. And so we have a lot of conversations about what survives long term. And, you know, I think it's interesting that we have... Uh, we have clay tablets, right, from Mesopotamia. Talking about, so like, we have bad restaurant reviews on clay tablets, right? We have, we have, like, tailor uh, receipts from, from uh, Mesopotamia because they were imprinted in clay that has lasted thousands and thousands of years. That is not going to be true for almost any other data medium that we have even even acid free paper yeah there are a bunch of them the the stuff you can find on on in cuneiform is pretty cool um but yeah let's see what we have going on in our agents now let's go to discover look at this 
Getting all sorts of data back. Okay. If we go to uh, Fleet, I wonder if there's an easier way to do this. Let's go to Fleet. And let's look at what's going on with our agent here. All right, so there's our Windows integration. Which collect events from the following Windows event log channels. Ah, change defaults. So PowerShell. Oh, snap! It does Sysmon out of the box! Well, that is not so bad. So all you had to do was install the Windows integration and you're done for, uh, for getting Sysmon data. If we go to uh, security and alerts, I don't know if we're going to have anything just yet. But maybe. Yeah, we need API integration required. New encryption key is generated for saved objects when you start encrypting. This isn't a key. It's fine. Yeah, we don't have any alerts just yet. We don't have any rules either. Is Sysmon only a Windows thing? Not anymore. Um. Yeah. You have to create some rules here. Um. Manage rules, what do we get? Yeah, we have to add some rules, I think. But let's go to detection and response. I love this, where we can actually create cases. Um, now let's go up to, let's go to discover, right? Which is like the raw sim or seam. Will I be doing any threat emulation? Maybe. I actually have a toy that I want to play with. Um, so we'll see if I can get that going. I have been working. I've been doing some research into Chrome extensions. And I was doing this on Wednesday. And uh, let me show you. You can check this out. I'm going to do a full write-up on this, but this is the repo for the thing. It's called Crux. And basically what it is, it's two components. It's a listening server just for ease of use. And it is also a, a Chrome extension. Now, the thing about this, this kind of follows on with some malware that we saw get a write-up this week from Unit 42 called Chrome Loader. And the way that it's doing its extension loading is exactly what I ended up finding out on my own. That was kind of funny to me. So basically what they're doing, let me open this in a new tab. What they're doing for this Chrome extension is they're basically killing every single Chrome window that it can find. And then it's restarting the Chrome window, right? With this load extension argument, which will load an unpacked extension silently in the background. And then this restore last session um, to bring back the previous windows, okay? So what's cool about this is that you can, if you, Say you're a local user, right? You got like a Cobalt Strike Beacon, or you got Interpreter, or you got um, Sliver, my personal favorite, um, onto a system through whatever way. In fact, maybe the way you did it was with a malicious MSI, just like Husky was telling us about today in his cool blog post, which you should check out as well, um, about malicious use of MSI packages which is really, really cool. So let's say you deliver this thing, right? Now, it turns out that this can actually pop a system shell for you, but let's say that you got a user context um, shell and you didn't have any credentials to the machine and you you know that you have some protections in place that are gonna prevent you from you know, hitting up LSAS and, and dumping creds that way. You wanna do something else, maybe something a little bit stealthier. Well, one of the things that you can do is you can write a Chrome extension that will phone home all sorts of stuff. Uh, chat, would you be okay if we quickly sidetracked to talk to demo this? Because it's it's pretty cool. But I, if you're more interested in doing the elastic stuff, um, that's fine. We can jump back to that. But if you want to see how this malicious Chrome extension works, I'm happy to demo that for you. Do it. All right. Uh, let me bring that up. 
So, me. Let me uh, git clone this thing. I was working out it on my other machine. Okay, git clone. Okay, so Crux has two components. It has a listening server and it has an extension. If you want to use the extension for anything other than local, you do need to change up the server host. But I'm going to run this on localhost 8000. Um, I'm pretty sure I have Flask installed. I do. Wonderful. Okay. So Flask is the dependency for the server because it's a Python server. And all the server is going to do is listen on port 8000 or whatever else I want. So I'll do it by default on 8000. So to do that, um, I'm just now realizing, yeah, actually this will work fine. So basically I'm gonna, this is in the Linux file system. So I'm gonna copy the extension to win home downloads crux cool okay now this is an unpacked extension so any source code that you put on the endpoint can be visible right by an incident responder but i mean there's nothing particularly scary going on in here what are we doing we're adding hooks this is using the Chrome extension API. This is literally like they let you do this. So the first thing we're gonna do is anytime somebody visits a URL, we're gonna intercept that navigation and phone home to our listening server with the URL that they visited. So we're just going like our server host slash you. And I did that just for different differences of handling, right? And then anytime there's a form request getting sent, we're gonna intercept the form data and send it to us instead. And as it'll get forwarded on to where it's going, but more importantly, we're going to get the information. So if the user puts in a password to any login form whatsoever, we're gonna get it. Watch this. All right, so uh, let's spin up the server. Do flask run P8000. All right, so it's running on port 8000. And now over in PowerShell, I'm going to run, um, I have, uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to run it with Edge because this works with Edge. Uh, I'm going to see program files, x86, Microsoft, Edge, application, msedge.exe, load extension equals C. Uh, oh, this is actually kind of funny. Uh, the load extension takes a, a forward slash, believe it or not. C forward slash users slash like all tired slash downloads slash crux. And here we go. What? Oh, downloads would be a good idea. So edge launched, but I've mistyped my freaking path. Let's try that again. Kaboom! Okay, so Edge launches. No indication that there's an extension installed whatsoever. Except for the external off extensions of development mode, right? Then, no, it's uh, killer. This isn't a Microsoft thing. It's a Chromium thing. That's why it's like that. Okay, now let's go check out our server. Let me side by side this. Hey, look. Anytime I visit a URL. I am getting the information sent to me. The navigation happens. If I go to LA Times, right? All this data comes in, including any of the in the I'm basically proxying, right? Um, anytime there's a form fill, 
even the stuff that I'm not doing voluntarily, it gets sent. Now, let's try a login. If I hit login, check it out. Okay, it went back. It went by really fast. Look at all the Facebook crap that gets sent to. God, it's so gross. But look. So you could set this to be the default way Edge launches. Absolutely. You could set this to be the way that uh, that that it launches, and you can, um, as as Chrome Loader was doing, you can kill ex every existing browser session. And this works, by the way, with almost every Chromium browser. For whatever reason, Brave does not like it, but other than that, it works fine. Um, Telefonica, thank you for the follow, and uh, MM Talagani. So. This is essentially what Chrome Loader was doing. And it see like, here's the thing. Is it as cool as a, is it as cool as a, like, no-click RCE? Of course not. And it is not solving the initial foothold problem. This is talking about, like, you have low privileges on a system and you're up against a pretty highly defended environment. How can you extract secrets from users without triggering the kinds of defenses that are going to get you burned and doing the kinds of things that are going to get you burned like trying to access LSAS or trying to go after volume shadow copies and, and dumping the registry hives there that have the secrets and then even then right trying to crack those hashes why bother when you can just listen in on whatever the user is doing in their browser that is I think a pretty slick way of capturing secrets. And I don't know, I I suspect there's been prior work on this, but I haven't seen a whole lot of it. Um, and I also don't know that there are a lot of detections for this. So what's interesting here, uh, unfortunately you cannot, you cannot drop an extension to load automatically into browsers like forever. Uh, at least not on Windows or Mac OS. Basically, you would need to get, if you wanted to set up the browser to load an extension, like by default, every time the browser was opened without this trick, you would need to host it either on the Chrome Web Store or the Microsoft Store. And they don't let you host malware. So what can't be detected? So the load extension could be detected, right? Using that command line, however, it can be obfuscated, certainly. Right, just like any other shell command. Um, the other thing is you don't have to use the shell command to open it, right? You can do just create like a straight up create process and use the argvs to um, send that information to the, to the create process. Um, so you can do it that way. So, my point is like the detections are possible they just don't exist i think at scale right now so it's a really good way to get something injected into uh in injected into an active user session so you can start collecting data from that session god look at all the crap that's going on on this website without me interacting with it that's pretty upsetting now i did try to get this to extract cookies as well and unfortunately, the cookies that I really want, um, I'm not able to get at. The, the cookie headers um, don't seem to be accessible from the, from the Chrome headers API. There are APIs to intercept, like, um, send headers and request headers. What I should do, though, is actually add something for authentication. So anytime it's using an authentication bearer token, um, you can capture that and get that relayed as well. So you could also get, um, you could do MFA bypass with token impersonation. It's not really an MFA by bypass, but if you get the, the session token from an authentication header or an authorization header, you're golden, right? So again, pretty powerful because you're using everything that the browser has access to. All right. So that's Crux. And if you want to check that out and play with it yourself, you can go check that out.
I will probably be doing a a more formal write up of Crux in the not too distant future because, yeah, it kind of seems like it's a sort of not super known thing. I'm not totally sure about that though. I will say this: it's for me, it's at least as interesting as the Mister Doc's Web View Two stuff, right? Where you're like sending somebody ob like an obviously uh, suspicious um like application for them to to run yes that can also intercept stuff but like you got to get them to run that all right i want to see what we have here so let's go to discover discover okay and i should be getting sysmon data I have logs, metrics, elastic cloud. Uh, win log dot event data dot event ID. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So win log. Come on, let's add a filter. Winlog dot channel is we only see security and system right now. Um, let's go get the security ones at least and see what that looks like. All right, let's see how the data goes. So this is not the full data, it looks like. You couldn't make a shortcut on the desktop that launches with the load extension flag. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you can. And depending on your permissions, you could maybe even modify one that exists. Oh, we do have... Here we go. Event source ID is one of... What do you got for me? Sakuda, thank you for the follow. All right, here we go. Here's like an actual piece of data here. An account was successfully logged on. Show me everything. Service.exe provided. This is cool that it's all parsed, but I need the event ID. I live and die by event IDs. Please give it to me. Event.code. Okay, so winlog.event.code is what I want to see. So winlog.event.code. 
Or is it just event.code? Yeah, it is. It's just event.code. Uh, let's just look for 4624s. Hell yeah. Look at this. I see. So that's, they've changed the UI for this a little bit. I, I actually like this a lot better. So there's a popover to see this rather than like expanding in the view. This is really nice. All right, event.code, system security, and we can, oh, we can page through them here too. Oh, I love this. This is so much nicer than we had it. Um, we had this so much nicer uh, here than we did with Waza. Hey, Zakuda, yeah, in fact, earlier in this stream, we set this up from scratch today. <laughs> so if you check out the VOD, you're able to learn how to do this. And... In addition to Twitch, we also cross-stream to YouTube. Uh, so listener asked about Crux. Are you executing Crux through a share rather than on a disk? Oh, so the difference that you saw there, listener, was that I was running Crux server from WSL, but it was still on the same system, right? It was still localhost. That was just because I prefer working in Linux, and so I, I run through WSL for most of the stuff that I do. But... Uh, for ease of use, I copied the Crux extension over to the Windows file system so that Edge could see it. So you have to drop the extension onto the file system in order to launch the thing. But you can, but here's the thing, you can put that extension anywhere that is user writable, including, including... We go to app data and local and go to like Microsoft Edge. There are, there's going to be extension. The default is the default profile, right? And so you could add extensions as a folder and just drop it there. And no one would notice it because it's, that's where extensions are supposed to be. Now it won't be named the right way. Um, there are going to be indicators, but you can clean that up if you want. You can even get the right extension ID if you if you want to do that. It's definitely doable, and it's a lot. It's going to allow you to load this thing in and collect data. I I think in a pretty stealthy way. All right, so we're getting the Windows event IDs. We're not getting Sysmon data though, which is a little concerning. Let's go back over to. Um, it's service, service, Sysmon 64. It is running. Um, I'm going to restart the service though. I'm going to restart service Sysmon 64. Um, And I want to see what's going on with the Elastic Agent. Okay, we're going to restart the service. Agnet. Okay. And with any luck, that will mean that we are getting Sysmon logs. I want event code one. Yeah, give me, let me see that. That's what's up. Sysmon operational, baby. That's what you want. Oh, so good. I gotta tell you, this was a million times easier to set up than Wasa. <laughs> I like Waza too, but this was so much easier to do. And then in terms of detections, what do you want to do with it? Um, I mean, if we go back to our integrations. Let's go to our security integrations, right? There's a bunch. Anomaly, Alien Vault. That's a cool one. Um, 
and it's easy to do too um where you can ingest threat intelligence directly from here and connect it to your alien vault uh, api and, and if there are any indicators that match um you can get an alert there that's pretty neat audit d for linux it's very important um yeah not bad at all now the next part in the book for threat hunting right is like creating rules enabling the detection engine Is there anything like is there anything that gets dropped to the disk that you can alert on like an extension ID? Um, the extension ID will change every time uh, you make a change to the file, <laughs> so you can customize that, and so that you can't use a static uh, detection for that. Do I read those books cover to cover? Yes, I do. Um. That might be, like, my most secret sauce, honestly, for learning stuff, is that I read textbooks like they're novels. And I read documentation the same way. It's It can be boring, but if you power through it, you just, you gain superpowers. Because you have learned all of the, if, if you're paying attention, you can learn um, all of the details about how things work. Uzi, thank you for the follow. All right, so they're telling us to go to the detections tab, which we can do. This seems different. Detect. A new encryption key is generated for saved objects each time you start Kibana. Without a persistent key, you cannot delete or modify rules after Kibana restarts. Set a persistent key. Add the X pact setting with any text value of 30 in the Kibana.yl. Oh, okay. So we have to add the encryption key here. Killer. Absolutely. The Windows Internals textbooks, part one and two, there's two of them. <laughs> and yeah, they're, they're a beast, but it, absolutely right. If you power through it, and I would like do it a couple of times too, because especially the stuff where they're doing like the kernel debugging, that's a lot. Um, but if you power through it, yeah, you learn all kinds of stuff about how Windows works that you would you really can't learn any other way. Absolutely wild. All right, I want to get rid of this warning, so we're gonna. Don't call me, sir. I work for a living. Um, I really wanted, Scarello, I really wanted to be going to DEF CON. However, I will not be going on account of the situation with the BA 4.5 and BA 5 and upcoming BA 2.75 variants of COVID. Um, I do not believe there is a way for a gathering in Las Vegas of that scale to be safe for anybody and myself included. So for that reason, I'm, uh, unfortunately going to have to defer I am hoping that the next conference that I will be going to uh, is the Wild West Hack and Fest in Deadwood in October. All right, let's sudo vim Etsy, <clears throat> Etsy Kibana, Kibana.yaml. Dot encrypted. So they don't even have that. So let's just go back up to the XPAC section. Okay. And we're just going to add encryption key and set it to seclab123. Uh, 32 or more characters. So 
let's just get one. sudo apt install y uuid. So everyone is sir or ma'am unless told otherwise. I ain't no officer. Let's just grab that UUID. Great for when you just need long random stuff. Okay. All right, if we reload this page, if we still get that. I mean, the config has to be reloaded, so. <laughs> eh, we'll leave that alone for now. I go to manage rules. It doesn't really take me anywhere. Um, let's also, for sanity, uh, while we're in here, let's go to stack management and users and add a new user because I don't want to have to keep using the elastic user. So I'm going to add just me. <laughs> Love that dark mode. And the role is going to be super user. Nice. All right. The reason I wanted to do that is because we're going to restart Kibana because since we've um, sudo systemctl daemon reload. And restart Kibana. Not elastic. Just Kibana, because I wanted to um, get that API key configuration working. Hey, Frackery. Good to see you. Yeah, still needs to spin back up. I hope. Hope I didn't break anything. No, I didn't. I'm just impatient. Maddox, thank you for the follow. What am I working on? Well, Frackery, today we have been rebuilding an Elastic server from scratch. There we go. Why isn't it in dark mode? Oh, phew. You seem quite familiar with seams in general. Would you recommend Elastic to someone completely new? Uh, maybe. It really depends on what you're new at. If you mean completely new to seam work, uh, it's an okay starting point. If you're new to system administration, definitely no, because you're going to have to do all this stuff yourself. Um, unless you do an out-of-the-box solution, like Security Onion, which is a cool place to start, honestly. Um, I would recommend getting started. The other thing is, like, what are you interested in from an employment standpoint? I would maybe check out Splunk training. Uh, there is a very specific reason I do not use Splunk in the lab. Because I do not want 
to limit myself to 500. Is it 500 megs? I think it's 500 megs of logging data for the trial of Splunk. And that's like not enough. Your work uses Elastic and it's the first sim you start on. Oh, that's awesome then. Yeah. You know, Splunk is great. We've done stuff on Azure Sentinel. Um, I don't know anything about QRadar other than that nobody likes it. Maddox says it's the megabytes. Yeah, that's what I thought too. 500 gigs would be fine. <laughs> I'd be happy to accept that limitation. And it's just not the limitation. Oh, Frackery, thank you. Glad I'm looking good on your 55-inch television. Let's go back to the security and see if we can... Did that solve the encryption key problem? All right. So it seems like... Oh, this is cool. So now that we've fixed the encryption key problem, look, we can actually create new rules. I love that. If we create a new rule, you can do a custom query, right? So, for example, uh, event correlation, that's really powerful. Um, but I think there should be, like, rule sets that we can add without having to do custom rules. Right? Right? Yes, load elastic pre-built rules and timeline templates. That's what I wanted. It's like, I know I don't have to do all of this. By the way, so this is the first time I've done a stream with the standing desk standing. How is the shakiness of the camera as I'm typing and talking? Is it too much? Is it not a problem? Did not notice any shakiness. That's what you want to hear. Awesome. Very exciting. I like the, uh, I feel much better uh, standing up doing this um, than sitting down, especially for the long streams. So that's great news. If I'm able to do that standing. Also, as a, as a teacher, it just feels weird to sit down for a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I spent my entire career standing up and talking to people, so being able to do that in this format is a huge quality of life improvement. If I could walk around while I was doing it too, that would be even better. Nothing short of an earthquake will shake this cam. That happened! That happened. There's a clip of that happening. There was an earthquake here in LA, and it was happening while I streamed. It was very fast, but there was a noticeable jolt. A treadmill. I'm a bike guy. And I do have a, an indoor trainer <laughs> to a stream while while uh, riding the bike. Okay, let's uh, check for PowerShell stuff. Oh, hell yeah. Look at all this. Okay. So we actually have rules. Um, no alerts so far. So let's do something evil. Let's go SSH over into our uh, machine. And let's, um, I'm just gonna use CyberChef for this. Because it's easy. Um, yeah, 2Base64. Uh, we'll just do calc.exe. But um, I actually have to encode it first. Encode text. Encode text. Uh, that comes first. Encode it to UTF-16. Yes, very good. Uh, the reason why you have to do this is because Windows uses wide strings, also known as 16-bit strings. 
So you have to change your text from UTF-8 to UTF-16, then encode it to base64. That's what happens when you do this in the PowerShell flavor. Um, but if we do PowerShell.exe, nope, window style hidden, and we'll do ink, we'll pa paste that in. Uh, get process, or um, let's see if uh, calc.exe triggered. We'll go back to our agent here and, and see what happened. Um, we'll refresh, refresh to see if we got any alerts on encoded PowerShell. We should have one. Mr. Rear says null byte. Um, let's test it out. I have PowerShell right here. Hey, look, calc pops. Get out of here with your null bite. No, in all seriousness, it's because PowerShell is is uh, forgiving when it comes to stuff like that. Uh, let's go over to Discover and see if we're seeing event code equals one. That's still our our search. Did you know you can use the FTP console to execute PowerShell? Doesn't spawn PowerShell with log beat logs. Say more about FTP console. Like if FTP is enabled? Have you ever thought about streaming in 4K? I have. Um, I don't have 4K monitors. <laughs> Uh, now that GPUs are a little bit cheaper, um, now that GPUs are a little bit cheaper, I may upgrade some stuff and move over to 4K. I've enjoyed doing the 1080 in part because Twitch does support 4K, um, but your bit rate is going to be crazy high. And that's one of the things I've been trying to be good about bit rates to make it more accessible to people. Um, Twitch actually wants you to stream at uh, 6,000 DPS, and I stream at 5, which is still supported by 1080p, but it makes it a little bit easier for people to load on devices and slower internet connections. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to see event.action, I want to see the... Oh, hey, look, <laughs> I was looking right at it and I didn't realize it. Um, process.args. Nine hundred thirty six P. That's interesting. Oh, that's cool. So you can filter through. There's a bunch of stuff in here. So process.args. So the reason why you want to do this, right, is process parent args. So I want to basically like toggle column and table. Process parent args, tar target column and table. So good. Oh, this is so much better. Hey, Gray Fox. We have built an elastic stack from scratch, and now we're testing to see how the elastic agent does with ingesting data. And I got to tell you, I friggin' love it. I'm definitely going this way rather than using Waza. It is so much easier. Um, and look at this. So we can see plainly here was the PowerShell invocation, right, of calc.exe. And then there's calc.exe. So how did I do that? Um, basically, what I did was I looked at the document itself here and then looked for the field names that I wanted and then chose each of the fields that I wanted and did toggle column and table. And that changes the view in 
in Kibana of what you're looking at. And so usually this is when I'm doing like PID hunting and process hunting, things like that. This is exactly what I want to do. I want command line, um, parent command line, PID and parent PID, right? And that gives me a nice story about what's going on. And yeah, look at this. So you can even see if I added the PID here, you would see plainly that this was kind of like SSH into here, con host launches, that launches command.exe and then we got calc. Sysmon gives away the game. Really, really nice. Really nice. Now, I still want to know if those alerts are happening, though. And if not, we'll make a custom one. Because I want anytime some clown runs encoded PowerShell, I should see it. Oh, that was observability alerts. Not where I wanted to go. Security alerts. Yeah, fine. Let's make a new one then. We're going to create a new rule. Yeah, custom query. So the custom query is going to be something like event.code. Actually, event dot. Or process dot args. And event.code one. Make rule to decode base 64. I just want to have the alert here um, for now. Let's preview the results, see if we get anything. Hmm. Uh, oh, wait, do I have to do this with, um, let's go back to discover real quick. I might have to do this with, uh, Lucene rather than KQL, which is, I think, can you, Mr. P PC Fix It, that's exactly what I was doing. Can you not create a query from a log event in Discovery? Yes, you can. Um, Let's just do event code one here. Uh, oh, interesting. This is the last 15 minutes. Let's go last hour. Has it been that long? No. Am I Portuguese? No, I am not Portuguese. My ancestry is uh, Irish and Polish Ukrainian. <laughs> but born and raised in the United States. You look identical to my Portuguese friend. Okay. Why on earth are we not seeing
Where'd all our log data go? Is our retention that low? That it's like refreshed so quickly? There it is. That's wild. We might have to modify the retention. Okay, so there it is. And then so process.args and process.args. Nice. Okay, so that actually is going to work. All right, let's preview those results. Hell yeah. Okay, that works. Um, about rule, severity, no. Can we change the severity, please? Yeah, no, there we go. Name, uh, coded PowerShell. Commands, severity. That would be a high, thank you very much. Default risk score, 75. We'll tag it with PowerShell, because why not? Uh, PowerShell enter Windows. Dope. Description required. Text, base 64, encoded, yes commands. All right, schedule rule runs every five minutes. Additional look back time, one minute. Love it. Action frequency performs no actions. Um, on each rule execution, hourly. So we could index it. We could send an email. We could do Slack, pager duty, service now if you hate yourself. Um, we're not going to perform any actions, though. <laughs> we're certainly not opening a JIRA ticket. Uh, we're going to create and enable the rule. And so, we go to alerts. We have one! What can we do with them? Hey, Husky. Good to see you, buddy. Now that we have a rule, we can add to a new case. Security Onion doesn't need to be your case manager. You can just do this in Elastic, right? We can add to a new case. The case of the curious calc. We'll call that a high, just like the alert. What up with this calc? Did I get a new camera? I did not get a new camera, Husky. I did two things since you've last seen me. One, I'm standing up rather than sitting down, and two, I adjusted the uh, focus to manual, and I think that made a lot of difference. Okay. We'll create the case. And now somebody's got to work it. <laughs> you know? But now we have a functioning sock. We go over to detection and response. We have open alerts. We have recently created cases, the case of the curious calc, right? So somebody can go work this thing the way that they're supposed to add comments. This is how it's supposed to be. This is how it's supposed to be. So we have successfully from scratch spun up elk and it's really not as hard as I thought it was. <clears throat> and yeah, that's right. Right, for, for getting alerts, we have custom rules, but this is the one that we want to uh, we want to hang on to. What is Elastic made for? So Elasticsearch is made for um, essentially associative searching and quick optimiz optimized searching of data from, from log sources. So Husky, I think this stuff is pretty new. Honestly, I don't know how long it's been in here, 
by default. But it is, it is hot to death. And we even, I'm using the elastic agent, before you got here, I'm using the elastic agent to hook in to the uh, Windows events. And I gotta tell you, it was so easy. It was one click to get Sysmon stuff integrated. It was way easier than doing it with Waza. So that's how we're gonna be doing that from now on. So in the sec lab repo, Um, we're going to add the automation uh, to spin this up, right, with Ansible. This is the newest version of Elastic. Yeah, Wally. What does it detect without needing to create new rules? So the default rules, the kind of Elastic out-of-the-box rules, are pretty solid. You can see them here. There are 674 rules. They're all tied to... Um, threat indicators. Just alert on any PowerShell that you Please don't do this to people. Here's what you should do. Um, your your organization should have a really deep conversation with itself about who needs to be running PowerShell. Alert on any MSIs. We did link your blog post, Husky, before you got here. Endpoint security. Yeah, the, the write-up from Husky about MSIs is... I, I've been curious about how MSIs do their thing because I've seen them in the wild. Um, and I've always been just like, because I'm a Linux guy, I kind of missed like, how do you build them? And I have to I have to say, before he wrote the blog post, Husky was very kind and walked me through, like I was five, um, how you build MSIs with Visual Studio. And it was invaluable for me. I uh, really appreciated that. And then sort of that same wisdom is now available for everybody in this blog post. It was really cool to see that. I mean, we can try to do evil stuff, right? If I try to put Meterpreter on here, it'll... I suspect it'll yell at me. Um, no? Metasploit? No? All right. Invoke Mimikatz? Yeah, that'll probably do it. Potential invoke maybe cat's PowerShell strip. Yeah, that would definitely do it. So anytime, in, if we look at these rules, you can see the query, right? And again, that's kind of a nice thing about doing this with open source stuff is that there's no secret sauce. Here's the query right here. So it's pulling from the PowerShell script block stuff. Um, and it's looking for the string, the text dump creds or dump certs or sec URL LSA, log on passwords, the stuff that you would see. Now, if that's obfuscated, you're obviously not going to see that, but still pretty handy. If we go over to detection and response, notice that we've got that open case, right? So there is some, some work that we can do there. You also feel silly if you don't detect those strings, yeah. So honestly, I'm feeling pretty good about this, and I'm, I'm feeling like this is a pretty good stopping point for today. It was, you know, two and a half hours of stream. We got the Elk stack up and running, um, and I'm going to leave it up as is so that we can add other stuff to it, like domain controllers and whatever else. But we now have a way of easily adding agents to, um, to our fleet using the fleet server. Really nice way of doing it. And I have to say, this is like the way to make this work easily. I'm, I'm a huge fan of this. Um, especially if you want to do it for $0. So in terms of what comes up next for the lab, we're going to start running some scenarios and, and playing with detections. Next time, I, it may be in a, two weeks, um, but in, in our next Saturday session, we're going to do the next level of monitoring, which is understanding what attacks look like from Wireshark. I know there was a request to look at how packet capture can inform threat detection. And so we're going to take a look at some common attack vectors like Metasploit and look at it from the perspective not only of what our 
elastic agent can see, but also from what uh, Wireshark could see, what packet capture can see, and how to use that information to our advantage. All right, so I think that's going to do it for this Saturday. I hope you had a great time and learned something. I know that I did. Let's see. Oh, right, of course. Our schedule is working as intended, so GoPro is in fact on, and we're going to go ahead and raid GoPro. So, friends, until next time, let's get the hack list going. Uh, make sure that you check out other InfoSec streamers on that list. But until next time, friends, please be good to yourselves, be good to each other, and happy hacking. We'll see you next time.